obvious that we're still fighting uh, uh, COVID as far as audience, but we just, uh, we're going to do that and, uh, and uh, enjoy uh, the conversation to come. I am Dr. Elizabeth West with the uh, Center for Studies on Africa and its Diaspora at GSU. And we, in coalition with uh, Kennesaw State, Agnes Scott College, and Auburn Avenue Research Library have sponsored this four-day trip uh, visit with uh, Chef Sally Ann Robinson. Uh, and we're going to uh, engage in conversation this evening with Chef Sally Ann uh, to talk about uh, the initiatives uh, that are undertaking and that they hope to undertake on uh, Defusky uh, to work toward the preservation uh, and security of the uh, history and heritage of black people, uh, not only on Defusky, but also uh, along the Gullah Corridor. Um, on our uh, panel with Chef today uh, is Kelly Spencer, who is Dr. Kelly Spencer, who's going to narrate, I mean, uh, moderate, uh, and Dr. Samuel Livingston from Morehouse College Department of History, and uh, my colleague Dr. Evans uh, from WGSS at GSU. And, uh, and again, I'm looking forward to a lively conversation. What we also hope to do uh, out of this conversation is to discuss ways for those of us who are interested uh, to build the, co you know, the partnerships and coalitions that we've begun uh, to construct with CHEF uh, and see and think about how we can move uh, these um, coalitions uh, forward. Uh, to make a difference on uh, on Defusky again and along the corridor. So I'm going to hand it over and get out of the way. Good afternoon, uh, almost evening, everyone. <laughs> My name is Priscilla Dickerson, and I am the Representative Research Division Manager here at Auburn Avenue Research Library. Library and let me say Auburn Avenue Research Library on African American. Um, I have the pleasure of welcoming you to our library, and also I have the pleasure of inviting you back. Please come back to visit us and utilize us for any of your programming and your research needs. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, thank you for those beautiful introductions and welcome. Thank you for the Auburn Research Library for hosting us. Um, I am Dr. Kelly Spencer, and um, oh, I was just about to say, and I'm the assistant principal at <laughs> such as <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> um, I am a lifelong um, educator and learner, and um, that is what has brought me to this space. So um, I'm a mom. I'm a wife. Um, throughout our journeys as a family, we um, would do something that we call intentional vacationing. And um, every time we would go somewhere, we would ask our young children, we have a 12-year-old, a 10-year-old, and an 8-year-old, we would ask our children, where do you see yourself in this space? How do you see yourself in this space? Think about times long ago where um, what kids like you look like in this space. Um, and one particular vacation for us was very memorable for me and my husband. And we had a um, very um, good discussion about how we would move forward. But we were in St. Augustine, Florida. We would go there for um, spring break. His parents lived in Jacksonville, Florida. So that was a nice little place to visit and still be able to be close to family and to go to the beach because I love the beach um, because I grew up here in landlocked uh, metro Atlanta so the beach is something very serious to me um, so um, I we were in St. Augustine we were on a tour we always make sure we take the tours we do all the history 
we were on a tour and we were on the little trolley driving by the um, the market and the tour guide said this is where goods were sold like your fruits and your vegetables and things like that and my kids kind of looked okay and um, they also were very aware that other things were sold at that market and they asked us, my son asked the question were people like me sold at that market and it was just a question that the tour guide was just not ready <laughs> to answer. But the truth of the matter was, yes, absolutely. Um, and we always wanted our children to have an understanding of what, what, what we're doing, why we're going, and what your experience means to you. And I said all that to say that led us through um, some, some years of getting to a space and um, led us to Defusky Island. And um, we started, my family and I started a business called Inkwell Properties, where we are very intentional about the properties that we purchase for vacation purposes, but also for educational purposes. Um, and our first goal was to buy properties that were in, um, areas where we were brought into this country. And so um, Defusky for us is our first um, property that we purchased. And um, I think that is very important because of what Defusky holds and, and the value that it holds, how untouched it is, and the culture that is there, and the preservation that we need to have in that space. Um, and so I do want to um, welcome all of our panelists and thank them for being here. I just kind of wanted to give a background as to why I'm sitting here <laughs> because there would be no other reason why I'm sitting here. <laughs> but the Fusky is close to our hearts and it means um, a lot to us. And um, so we want to get it kicked off and started with a couple of questions. Um, the first question. And I'll start with um, Chef Sally Ann. Um, what is unique about Gullah culture, specifically on the Fusky? Woof. Okay. Unique on the Fusky because I was born and raised there, and being sixth generation from there, not only did I get to be involved in what it took to live there, I I'm back home now because it was a great part of the things that I went from, I came back to not the way they were, but the island itself of generation of family members being um, from there. Folks, the Gullah people on the Fusky Island, as I remember, they were struggling. I mean, they didn't struggle to have because they were unique in knowledge of knowing how to manage in also, we wake up in the morning, it wasn't a question of what we're gonna do, it's getting it done. Whether it was going in the field farming, whether it was going in the woods to get the wood so we could have fire for the stove or the wood heater, whether it was going in the ocean to get the seafood that was so plentiful and so tasty, or um, going into the woods again to hunt. We never question our families about why we gotta do this because that was a part of our life. So the uniqueness that I find is the way that folks know what they had to do and didn't question them doing it. So the uniqueness to me was the survival, learning and doing and surviving through all, all things, good, bad, and indifference. So it's just working. Might not even need it, um, but I'm just so grateful to be here. Um, I'm from another Gullah community, uh, the Gullah community of North Santee in Georgetown County, South Carolina. And I can't speak about the Fusky. Um, I know the food is good, I, <laughs> but, but um, just in terms of a little bit more general about, about Gullah culture, why it's significant, I think to me it's significant 
and I'm, I'm an associate professor in Africana Studies at Morehouse College. Um, and we changed the name from African American Studies to Africana Studies because we wanted our students to understand themselves as a part of an African global diasporic community or pan-African community. To me, Gullah culture takes that very academic sounding topic and brings it home to what I call, well, I don't even call it, I'm sorry, Houston Baker called it Little Africa. <laughs> Little Africa, and he talked about, you know, Little Africa. He grew up in, in Kentucky, um, in Louisville, Kentucky, um, but Little Africa is all these little small communities that seem like they're, you know, it's like, oh, it's very homey, but no, we're talking about global cultures too, being tied into a global culture. Um, uh, you know, I, when I read the question, I read it a couple of days ago, I was like, okay, uh, how can I say this quickly? Um, but I, I wanna make sure I don't leave anything out. But I'll, I'll just say it like this, um, that from the moment that the first enslaved African set foot in this country in 1526 um, in South Carolina and then in Georgia, it tied in black folks into like a global movement. If we look at what's happening in the 16th century and the 1500s, it's nothing but change. Every place is changing. It's changing in Japan, it's changing in Ethiopia and East Africa and West Africa. These huge empires are changing. But we tend to not talk about our, our home as a part of that global change. So when I, like I read, and I was <laughs> reading your, 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 um, your cookbook, uh, Chef Robinson, and first of all, I can't wait to you know, flex and try to, because I, I cook, I cook, I ain't gonna lie. My, my mom raised Gullah, my mom taught me how to cook, my granddaddy taught me how to, taught me how to cook. Uh, you know, just looking, just, right. just trying to pay attention. And I'll try to be quick. But I see Gullah culture as a part of a global African culture. It ties us in to so many other cultural movements. Um, and you know, and I, I, you know I'm, I'm an Afrocentrist too, so I use this idea of the African worldview. These core four ideas that guide how we study black cultures, you know, in terms of epistemology, cosmology, ontology, all the ologies, whatever. But Gullah culture is the lived example of all of them. And to me, that's why it's special. Okay, test, test, hey. Uh, good evening. Thank you so much uh, to the good doctors and definitely to Chef for being here. Again, my name is uh, Stephanie Evans. I'm a professor at Georgia State uh, in Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies, but also affiliate faculty in Africana Studies. Uh, my background is African American Studies. I earned a PhD from the W.B. Du Bois Department of Afro-American Studies at UMass Amherst. And um, Defusky is so important to me, and Chef in particular is so important to me because I grew up as um, a young black girl in a world that hates black people and hates women. And so um, I was very fortunate to uh, be raised in some very good circumstances in some parts of my life, but not so good circumstances in others. And so the internal messages that I received when I was young um, were mixed messages, and there was not a lot of clarity, not a lot of, um, of voices because I moved from Germany, Illinois, Arizona, New Mexico. For, so for me, when I started reading books by black women, it shifted something in me. In particular, um, Anna Julia Cooper's essay on the higher education of women, which she wrote in 1890, that was the first time that I felt a clarity and that I was at home in my body as a black woman and that I was clear that I had something of relevance to offer to the world. So I became obsessed with reading black women because I was like, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I went through all of these, all through school and you know, school in different parts in Arizona where they outlawed black studies. So I didn't, I wasn't raised with an understanding that there was an intellect that black women contribute. And so I came to Chef Sally Ann's work um, by, uh, you know, my work in creating a library um, called Africana Memoirs. Again, this, this concept of diaspora, of situating 
particular black experiences within a community of, of experiences throughout the world um, and, and very diverse communities throughout the world. And so I created a, a, a database, AfricanaMemoirs.net, where I just habitually collected black women's stories until now there's like five, 600 stories. And Chefs was one of those. And I'm almost ashamed to say it on stage, uh, but I can't cook, all right? <laughs> so uh, I'm just looking at, at black women's experiences and I see, but I, I married, you know, Curtis Bird, who's my husband, he cooks. And so I do know good food. I just know I'm just not the one that's gonna be making it. But um, actually in a series through Auburn Avenue Research Center, I um, began to study um, black women in wine. And I started with yoga. I started with how do black women in a world that is so antagonistic find um, health? And how do black women elders in particular, black women writers, write about health and wellness in ways that we can understand. And so the first study of that was mental health, and then I looked at the history of black women writing yoga, women like Rosa Parks, who did yoga. And then I got to this topic of wine, and I was like, you know what, I love wine, I'm a wino. Let me just see what black women have to say about wine, and lo and behold, there's you know, well over 100 references to black women and wine. So Chef Sally Ann's book, uh, cooking the gull away has pear, peach, plum, persimmon, mulberry, elderberry, and elderberry wine. And I was like, see, now you know. This is something I need to, I need to, this is research. It's research. I need to know what's happening. So I reached out to Chef, just, you know, just, being nosy, that's what research is, right? Um, organized curiosity, as Zora Neale Hurston said. Um, and Chef reached back. And we had the most amazing conversation about what it means to be a living legacy that is carrying on traditions amid constant barrage of co-optation, of exclusion, of people talking over you. Uh, uh, and so, you know, we just started, we had this connection where I was just like, you know, we've seen, the, and the high on the hog had just come out. And so there are these stories told, but there's also the story, and I'll end with this, the, there's also the, the story, um, you know, when someone was serving watermelon wine, I told you I'm a wine I was paying attention. Um, and, they, and this was the last celebration because we're being pushed out of our home. And so it became clear to me that not only do we need to hashtag cite black women and hashtag cite a sister and have academic citations of black women, but we need to actually support the work. And that's where um, I think sh Chef's work on Defusky is absolutely unique and pivotal because it is her life work and it's something that we, you know, that we need to learn from and benefit from and support. All right, thank you all for that um, input and that unique um, perspective of the Gullah culture and um, the Fusky in particular. Um, so, let me get my next question. Um, what makes Gullah culture and Defusky significant and pivot, pivotal to American history? Oh, for me, as a child growing up, there were very little I knew about Gullah culture. The word Gullah, Gullah Geechee, those were words that weren't in our vocabulary basically because um, I just learned after it was probably too hard for our family, our grandparents and mom them to tell us about a very difficult time. Because there were things they shared with us and there were things they didn't. And when grown folks was around and we had kids running around, she'd be like, okay, y'all turn, come here. Go y'all and play. This grown folks business. So we was excluded from some of the things they talked about. 
But as I grew older and start seeing tourism came to the Fusky in the early 70s and sharing stories like, because I end up on one of the boat one day. For some reason, I always say, God put you in places for a reason. Um, the captain was sharing with the group of folks, not knowing who I was or whether I would, uh, they just wanted tourism people. So he just went off, he said, as the boat was tying. And I've forgotten, um, just to remind y'all, when you go up on the hill and you see a native, don't talk to them. They don't speak English, they live in tree hut, and they got bones in their nose. While my mouth dropped and I had to pick it up and went, why the H this man don't stop lying on us? So a surprise to them that he was actually talking about me, not knowing because he was in his little captain booth and all the tourism like my, and myself was to the bottom and I was just catching a ride that day, which I paid for. And then he went, uh-oh, I guess I got myself in trouble. Well, how many times you said this? How many times you told this to people and no one was there to defend what you were saying? So this lady chased me down trying to get me to speak to her based on what was wrong. Um, why were you saying he is not telling the truth? I said, ma'am, I'm sixth generation from that, on this island. Do I look like what he just described? And she kind of hold her chest up. No, ma'am, you don't. She said, you're a beautiful young lady. I'm saying that's why I said what I said. And I said, but I'm not going to stop you from going on his tour. You go on his tour and come back, and we'll talk later. And what she did, she saw no She was excited because she, now she, her curiosity was there. She saw another Gullah, um, native person. She spoke with them, and she came back because she started realizing what I said was truth. But not having to defend it was just another way that they got away with telling these lies and story. And then when you go abroad, because we live on this island we call the mainland, the other part going across the water. People look at you funny. People look at you when you say a word or something, you're looking at them like, what they looking at me for? So, to America. And I always, as I learn my history, the Gullah people is the backbone of America. Number one, couldn't have done it without us. What our kids don't know is it wasn't for them, we wouldn't be here in our position today. So I strongly, I strongly stress, like my parents and grandparents then would tell us stories, not all the stories that was hard for them, but teaching us the word survival because they knew no matter what happened, where you go, who you with, you had to take care of yourself. Watch your back. Don't eat from everybody. <laughs> Stay out of crowd. <laughs> These were things. Learn how to go out there and do the right thing. Do the right thing. Hold your head up, have manners and respect. But these things played a big part in my life and being, um, uh, African uh, and American in the US and start learning things that I never knew before because it wasn't taught to us in school, not at all. And then learning how strong and connected we were to a lot of things that made America what it is <laughs> from Washington DC on around the world. Helped build it and learning these things empowered me to say, whoa, I gotta be a part of not only just learning about it, but sharing it. And that's what encouraged me to write because I start seeing our meals changing. No, that's not how it goes. So instead of complaining also about what I saw all the things that was going backwards instead of forward for us, I said to myself, don't get mad, do something about it. And that's where I stand today as far as being a part of America, because I want to be just like my ancestors, not giving up. And that was the one thing I know they never gave up. Thank you. <laughs> I'm basking. Um, so I 
get my understanding of American history largely from um, John Hope Franklin and um, Darlene Clark Hine and Evelyn Higginbotham and um, professional historians. Um, but one way that I understood that Professor Franklin recorded the history of black people in the United States was his framing of how professional historians have written about us. Um, black professional historians have written about black people. And he said in the 1860s there was a um, kind of a recording of the presence of these, this is how Africans arrived to the shores. And then there were studies of, um, of uh, contribution, right? This is what black people have contributed to America. And then there were oppression stories, um, the, the studies of slavery in the late 19th and early 20th century, right? Of really starting to look at the history of enslavement, right? Of, of the regions and the, the encounters and things. And then there were studies of resistance. And this is how we get the, you know, the narratives of the slave revolts. And so there was this progression. And when I wrote um, my first book, I really wanted to tell the whole story because the story of Defusky and the story of black history in the Americas is not one part or one part. It's not a story of oppression. It's not a story solely of resistance. It's not a sto solely a story of, okay, we're here. It is all of those things. And so when I think about what Defusky Island means is that it's that clarity of that first Defusky Island and the Sea Islands. Again, when you look at something like High on the Hog, you can't understand food in this country without understanding African contributions to food. So I started, I was talking about wine. I'm talking about now tea. And tea and rice cultivation, right? Like, and um, if I was in Massachusetts, the, those Africans who were um, whalers, right? The Africans are and were uh, people with skills and knowledge. And so the story of Defusky and the story of black American history in American history is really a story of presence, of oppression, yes, but of that creative resistance, that how do we do things um, that are recognizable or not recognizable? Right, because we are not not everybody's talking to everybody. Some you know some things it's those for for those who have ears to hear. Um, but it's understanding that you cannot understand American history without understanding Black history. You can't understand Black history without understanding the history of the South and that bridge, uh, in particular, which there's just no better example than the Sea Islands and. That's what Defusky represents, I think, to me. Um, so I wanted to go last so I could have the least <laughs> amount that I have to say, because everything has been said. Um, but I, I would just, just add um, that I think Gullah culture, um, in many ways, is America's last best hope for how to be, how to be a real human, like how to treat people with kindness, how to see people. Like, you walk down the street, there's no such thing as, I'm too busy. No, that person that you see, you speak to. Because that, I mean, that's how we were raised. I mean, because, again, you know, you, you're never going to see, you know, for the spiritual folks, that we're never going to see the face of God on this plane. But I do see you. I see you. I see everybody. And that's, and that's the reflection. But historically, to me, we just have to start telling that story, telling that full story with Gullah, the Gullah people at, I won't say just the center of it, but a very, very, very central part of that story of African American history, of American history, and of world history. And I, I, I can't underemphasize that. I, I just, 
Um, can't overemphasize that, I guess, what I want to say. Um, and to really, to, in some ways, we have to push back against even the limits of just talking about us as American. Because yes, we are American, but the way that America talks about itself is in this haughty, you know, looking down on everybody. We don't want, we, that's, that's not what, to me, I don't see Gullah people as any part of that, but trying to actually connect with different communities. And there, I think that's where we really need to emphasize, like, study abroad, uh, connecting our students with different communities in the African world, in Haiti, in Cuba, in Jamaica, in Brazil, all of these great places that we take students to. Um, we're working on a study abroad to, to DR Congo. And when most, when most people hear that, they're like, are you crazy? Why should you take our students here? That's home. That's home. That's where between 25 and 46 percent of us, millions of us, were taken. That is home, and it's not all dangerous. That's you know, so to me, like I said, I, I hear when I think about the way that I was raised, and you were talking about all those different types of wine, except for elderberry. We grew every single one of those. I mean, strawberries, blackberries, just everything. Peaches, pears. You know, and you could go in your backyard and get that. Yeah. And that's something special. Yeah. That's something special. There was no such thing. It's, and I know, Chef Robinson, you and everybody who's, who's country, how many people had uh, canning, canning jars? <laughs> there you go. I that's it. Know. Yeah. I yeah, today. the Mason can jar. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So you grew what you grew during the growing season. Yeah. You pick, you save, you give away to people. Yeah. That's that's yeah. a part of the culture. And then what you then you save something for the fall and for the winter. I can't yeah. tell you how many times it was December or whatever, yeah. but you're eating canned pears on biscuits, <laughs> and and it's like, okay, I, I'm, you know, just thinking about that now. I took it for granted back then. Yeah. Think about it now, my mouth is watering, I'm sorry. And I, 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 but just to, just to bring it home, um, I think the values that Gullah people represent are in tune with a, a way of being human that seems radical in, in America today. It's like being truthful, speaking the truth is, is radical, you know. And, you know, so, I, so I, I thank God every single day. I have to say, too. I didn't really intend to like study Gullah culture as like my, my main area of study. I came out 1998 Temple University Afri African American Studies, hip hop in the Nation of Islam. That's still very important for me. The Nation of Islam very important for me in terms of my upbringing, um, not upbringing, but once I got into college. But Gullah was something that I rediscovered, and I look at it. I was like, man, what, are, what was what was I thinking? Because it touches on everything. The oral tradition. I mean, it, it touches on the food ways, the spirituality. Um, and I'm very big also. I'm a, I'm a Jopian Afrocentric scholar. So I make sure I emphasize that notion of African cultural unity. Doesn't mean that all African cultures are the same, but it does mean that they can be compared and we can look at it. I'm comparing, I'm looking at the way that we grew up organizing work. And I'm seeing the same patterns in Benin I'm seeing similar patterns in Congo. I'm seeing similar patterns in ancient Egypt, in Nubia. I mean, there, literally, there's a word. I got, got to share this one. Because I think the best example, you give a given example, we say we want to go beyond just America. Because we are, we're a global people. The word una. Una cha. Una cha. <laughs> that word, we can take that word back to West Africa, and we can look at it in the Sonyinka language, or, I'm sorry, Songhoi language, and, you, and that word is used in the exact same way. On a child, on a child, come here. Uh, Maurice, yeah. brother, on, 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 come, come here. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But it didn't stop there. Ona or Huna is the ancient Egyptian word for you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's the Songhoi word for you, and it's the Gullah word for you. Yeah. 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 I mean, this is, a, this is a global culture. Yes, it is. It's a global culture. So I'm going to be quiet. But I, I just want to say, I mean, definitely we've got to talk about that American history, but the global peace, that's, that's us. And I think you all touched so beautifully on that global peace that is held 
right there on that very small island yes. that I think folks thought that they were deserting and leaving our people there to not survive mm -hmm. and to not be and thought that they would come back years later and claim. and claim it. But they realized our people live. Our people thrived. A thriving community yeah. that that understood how to live on their own in on that land yes. with those waters and figuring it out and not needing anything from the outside to yep. give to them. And what we recognize now is that they they recognize it they see it and now oh let me figure out how to take from that so i think that that is something very important that you all are saying about that global peace that you don't those things are running through and you it, it's not forgotten it's still there um the next thing we want to kind of hit on is how does oral history contribute to the preservation of Gullah culture and the Fusky history? All history for me, um, I had mixed feeling at first because what I learned in school was not what the, um, I realized were truthful. So, and that's one of the reason my writing and my sharing is so important because I didn't want to feel like I was being confused by two type of, two world. And I'm talking about the book world and the story world. Because my parents, grandparents, they all were storytellers. And being storytellers, these folks spoke the truth. They wanted us to understand. And that word on a, on a and my grandmother, on a child, come here. Um, and we didn't question it. You dare question them calling you um, by these words. And let me say, not just the word Gullah, but Gullah Geechee. Gullah Geechee, from my learning, is two words, okay? Gullah is the dialect, Geechee is the people. So even in my tour, I share with folks to say, okay, um, the Gullahs, you'll find a lot of folks consider themselves Gullahs in the Sea Islands, the low country. And then you go to the cities like Charleston and Savannah, the big cities, people are called themselves Geechees. So I just define it as Geechees are just the uppity Gullahs. <laughs> but we all the same. We cut from the same cloth. I don't care what shade or color you are, we all cut from that bloodline that came from Africa and spread out through this world, sharing and caring. Um, I grew up with folks who cared about one another. N no matter how little they had, they shared if somebody had a need. So I wanted to also make sure that because I had children, I have 16 grandkids right now, wanted to make sure that I contribute to their knowing the facts and not the made up story. And for me, it was confusing once I left the Fusky and went to the city and they weren't even discussing it, not at all. My dialect was fluent in Gola, but I had to convert in order to fit in. It wasn't a good place for me to tell my kids right from wrong because some rights were wrong and some wrong were rights based on who you listen to, where you go, <laughs> and how you receive it had to be a part of how you grew up. That's what I start realizing. Stick to how you grew up and what you were told. So my joy is that I had ancestors. I am so proud to say I grew up with ancestors when the old was going out and the new was coming in because 
they did not spare the, um, what they did. Uh, <laughs> they say, spoil the child and spare the um, rod. No, no, they did not spare the rod. That rod was on us. We had to do as we were told. We had to have manners and respect all the time. You dare go somewhere and be disrespectful. Honey, you were in trouble. And they didn't have a problem embarrassing you to let you know that if you do it again, it can be more than this. Because I always feel that these folks might have had very little education, but their strength and their ability to do things was stronger than most. And it helped me understand that the power that was behind it, they didn't wait for somebody to give them stuff. They went out there and did it, and they didn't beg for it, they didn't borrow it. My mom said, two things you don't borrow, salt and sugar from nobody. I didn't understand that for a while. You do not go to somebody's house, because when you out of salt, go buy you some. Don't borrow salt and sugar, because you'll continue to borrow those salt and sugar. I grew up understanding that. Food, we grew, raised these food, and being on the Fusky, it also taught me closeness. When somebody passed, every, people came together, they didn't separate. When somebody was sick, they supported and helped each other. I never knew hunger growing up on that island, basically because there were more food than enough for all of us. And today there still is, but guess what? Look how many people hungry. You know, and that's sad. So in me sharing and seeing that the food we were eating and the way it was raised or grown or gathered was being changed because someone else didn't know how to, uh-uh, back up. Either you learn, you ask, and we don't share secrets. I still have a devil crab recipe I will not share. <laughs> my publisher asked me to put it in this book. I said, I'm so sorry, I cannot do that. I said, my mom is not here, but she will come back. <laughs> but she made it clear, do not put that recipe anywhere. The devil crab. Yeah, the devil crab. Oh yes, it is the bomb. <laughs> But I'll make all you want. <laughs> <I'm just laughs> but my children, I pass it on to my children and I specifically tell them, this is a family recipe. Some things you just don't give away. Just like your pride, just like the way you hoop, the way you are, no, you don't give those things away. You stand tall, I don't care if you have a little bit. You stand as proud and as tall as you can be with what you have. Be proud of who you are, because there ain't but one master, okay? And, he, and, and my pop used to say, you know, I don't care how we cut each other, everybody gonna bleed red, we still breathe the same air. And I had to really think about it. I said, you know, he right. So, back to this conversation, I get off sometime basically, because I start living, I start living, and that's what may have me write these, I start living those feelings and then I stopped writing them down because I want to share the things that I know my children, my grandchildren, my generations to come will have an understanding of the truth about what's been going on or how we can be, continue to be the best at who we are. My grandfather had a saying, come to see ain't like come to stay. You know people will come see you, it's all good. Let them come stay with you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so these are lessons and stuff that really help me to be and do the things that I'm doing. And I just get mind boggled over the fact that our children are not being shared what they need to know. We're giving them everything but their history. How are they going to provide if they don't know their history? How are they going to actually survive out there not knowing their history? This is, that is food alone. Is there a history? It's just like having to have water. I need my history to continue growing and being the person I am. Because if I give that up, I'm giving up on self and that's something I don't do. <laughs> uh, so, uh, oral, oral history and the importance of it? Yes. So, I, I had to, so amen to everything. <laughs> I mean, it's like, <laughs> what else could I say? 
I can say the name of my grandfather, Reverend Sam Barr, um, who, and again, I'm reading your book. <laughs> it was so funny. I, I went directly to the Sticky Bush um, uh, Blackberry Dumplings recipe because my grandfather, Sam, Reverend Sam Barr, and all of my cousins we grew up in a small community, we said North Santee, but the small part of their part of it was called Snow Hill. So we all gather on Snow Hill in, in the summer and, um, and he would take us in the woods when it's time to make the blackberry dumplings. <laughs> and like everybody got a pot. And you go out in the woods and you know, I, uh, I, forgot, you, I think you said your mother said to mind, mind them snakes and stuff. Yes. And daddy taught us how to walk and to, to see a snake in the first place. Mm -hmm. Um, and to find out which ones, of course, were dangerous, which ones you had to kill, um, but you know, which ones are poisonous or whatever. But we, nobody ever got, bit, got bitten, and we stayed in the woods. Yes. I mean, we, like 90% of our time was in the woods. And so when I think of that oral tradition, though, and I, I, I can't say it strong enough how much um, I agree with you in terms of the importance of food. Yes. And I think that's a way to reach out to our, our children. Um, because everybody loves good food. Yeah. I mean, and to me, Gullah, Senegalese, Ethiopian, mm, Haitian, in terms of food, teach them, I mean, reach out to them through that food, I think is, is such a beautiful way of passing on that tradition. Um, <laughs> I gotta say one thing. Um, and it, this this kind of reminds me of what Gullah kind of says not to do. And it's an oral tradition, um, not an oral tradition, I'm sorry, it's an article based on oral history of W.B. Du Bois and uh, by Dr. Dot Yancey. Y'all know Dot Yancey. Um, Georgia Tech, she just, I don't say she just retired what, a couple of years ago or, but she stepped down from, from our board at Morehouse. Be qu try to be quick. Um, du Bois, Benjamin Lajamais ben invited Du Bois over for dinner. And Du Bois called the house and he said, well, what's on the menu? And we put, uh, Dr. Mays, President Mays put his wife, I'm sorry, I, I'm blanking on her name. And I have to, I have to say too, um, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't share too much of this, but I had a tumor taken out of my right side of my brain. <laughs> I'm sorry, this, and this is a few months ago. So my memory is a little, it's a little, it's little okay. dusty. <laughs> okay. I appreciate you, thank no, you, thank you. But so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so Mays puts his wife on the phone and she says, um, this, this is what's gonna be on the menu. Du -du -du -du. du Bois says, well, I want duck. <laughs> and Mrs. Mays says, well, we're not, we don't have duck. Du Bois says, well, I will buy the duck and if you will cook it. And she cooked it. And I, I, from what I understand, it was delicious. But I, I'm thinking, I'm like, could I, have ever, could I ever do that? Invite somebody, somebody invite me to dinner. Du Bois. Du Bois. And it's like, to me, well, I think Gullah and oral tradition is so important, not just because of the different sides of the story that you would never get just from the archives. And, you know, we need that. We need the archives, but we also need that, that oral tradition. It's so important. But also, <laughs> because I see Du Bois, if you read Darkwater, a Gullah person, or a, a, I think he is, he is Gullah, um, played a very important role in, in his upbringing because they grew up on land in Massachusetts, Great Barrington, owned by a Gullah man. And he says it, he says it in Darkwater. Um, he says a, a tall, dark South Carolinian wore gold earrings. I remember that, old, old folks wearing them gold earrings. They said it deepens your spiritual vision. Who was given the trances, that's what Du Bois says. I see Du Bois as always trying to come back to his, like that African yeah. self yeah. <laughs> in, in different ways. Yeah. Now I have, uh, I'm, oh, you're gonna kill me when you see this article. I'm, I'm right about Du Bois, but you will appreciate the, it. It's the truth. It's the truth. It's, it's the, the truth. truth. But ooh, so man, oh my goodness, Oof. oh my goodness. But long story short, the oral tradition, the piece that I'm working on, it's about his conversation with the Herero people, and his relationship with the Herero people from 1907 to 1947, and that conversation that he had. And I always say, this is why we need the oral tradition. Yes. Because yes, we can go by Du Bois's record, but look at the silences of what 
and it's not being said. You know, the Senegalese, they have, they call, their, their greeting culture, Taranga, if I'm correct. Y'all correct me. Um, but I think it's, it is Taranga. If you don't greet correctly, look, how are you doing? How's the family doing? You know, and you spend like good five or ten minutes. You learn Wolof, you, most of it is gr like greetings. And to me, if you don't plug into that oral tradition, it's like you're not going to get the full story. There's a beauty and power in that. But that also means that we have to make sure we pay special attention to preserving that, that tradition, too. Ooh. Yes, this is just, this is so um, spirit-filling. I'm just, again, grateful to be here. Um, the oral tradition is, in my view, so important because it has to do with generations in that. Um, and this is, again, why I gravitated toward memoir and autobiography and life writing as a database because I needed to know what a chorus, a whole community, a whole world of black women from the continent, from the Caribbean, from Europe, from, I mean, you know, from everywhere had to say about life. And it's not like, you know, I didn't come from specific people with specific traditions. It's just in my family, we were like nomadic people, you know, we're, we're, were strewn. <laughs> and so um, I got bits and pieces from which I created a mosaic, but that was not a sixth generation on, you know, from this place with this language. And so what oral, tr what oral history has done for me is to allow me to fill in the gaps of that mosaic. And for those who, you know, those of us who uh, were not raised in a specific family from a specific generation, these oral histories, and that's why when we, when we spoke, the question I asked was, what partnerships do you have with universities? Because universities are so good at thinking like, we know every damn thing. Like we just know, oh, we, you know, we are the experts. We will, yes, the P, I have the PH and the D. <laughs> yes, you know, and so we're good at thinking that we know things, but we need to learn in community. We have so much to learn. And a lot of that has to be in spaces like this, but it also has to be what we assign in our classes, right? What we, who is reading what? Who are, who are we assigning? Who are we exposing? Who are we reifying? Whose ideas are we conveying? And so part of that is oral, and part of that is our responsibility to be that archive for those who have so much wisdom to share. Thank you all for sharing. And I will say that the beauty of that is, Dr. Evans, is that we do have the ability in colleges and universities to, to give those experiences. Um, I know before I even started um, talking to you all on the DIGS com committee, um, Dr. Scott and I, at Agnes Scott, had a conversation and she was talking about taking a group of students to the Sea Islands. Every student at um, Agnes Scott goes on a either study abroad or study within um, and th this year her group was going to the Sea Islands and I said well Heather she's my classmate I said well Heather you should take them to the Pusky you've got to take them to the Pusky you can't just stop in Hilton Head you've got to. she said well they already have a itinerary and and I said no 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 they've never seen anything like this before and I need you to go on Sally Ann's tour because the richness that you get in that oral communication, that oral history, she stops you at the museum on the Fusky, but it's totally different when you are on that bus with her, when she's taking you down those streets that she walked on, when she's taking you to her grandmother's home where she was born, when, she, when you're going to those grave sites and you're looking at those placards of young men that died in the Civil War, that died in all of these wars that it's not recorded anywhere. That history 
is there and she's preserving that oral history. And so we, as the community of educators, we've got to continue those experiences. Experiences are, are lasered in our memory and then it turns into the books. Um, but it, it, you can never take that experience away, you know? So I think that that's very, very important and I appreciate yes, what Chef is up. doing. Sign us up, please. <laughs> <laughs> you can teach a, a class, like every odd year. So in the spring of 23, 23, 2023, we'll be teaching again. We'll definitely come for those students. Okay, we'll, we'll work on it. Let, okay. let us know. And um, his, her name is Sadie Gray Mays. Oh, thank you so much. I'm, <laughs> Listen, listen. My my husband is the is the key. He he said he texted to me. <laughs> he's a, he, a fellow Morehouse man. Yes, he had he has the green. It he does. Oh goodness. And a small one, just for a small one is just for us. Yeah, I got my little Weber. But. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. Um, okay, so our next question, which we've kind of already touched on, but I think we can go into more depth. Um, why has food been so central to Gullah culture? Oh boy, because it paved the way for our culture to be the people they are, number one. And I say that because if it wasn't for the food, I mean, the people, the Gullah people with their food, I don't think America would be as, as knowledgeable today because they brought the okras, they brought the sweet potatoes, they brought the rice, and they knew how to and that's why they were put on a boat and brought over here to make it for others to, um, to have. Um, even the indigo. We have two ladies on the Fusky that does indigo. And every time they talk about this indigo, they bring up this lady. She's a white slave owner. Um, she was a slave owner. She was a daughter of the slave owner. And she gets the credit. And I'm like, but her slaves were the one that taught her or showed her how to produce, how to grow and make the dye. How come she gets the credit on this? And it's just like, you know, the reason I'm doing what I'm doing today to save as much as the history, um, share it, um, going back home, getting these houses restored, basically because once they're gone, the story goes with it. These graveyards are being overgrown because nobody wants to care about those people who actually was a, the reason we are doing what we're doing today. So for me, I also say when it comes to the food, there isn't very few people or culture that don't want a part of it. Most people do. Once they've tasted, they want more. And, you know, I learned to cook on a wood stove. I never knew the difference until I had an electric stove. Then I started having to adjust the dial to learn how to cook the food. We grew up with the wood stove, there were no dials. You cooked that pot on, there was the most heat, the less heat, and then the warmer. You slide that pot from the high cooking to the medium cooking or the summer cooking to the warming cooking. They knew how to make sure that that food was just right after you came in from the fields, the woods, or hunting, or whatever the deal was, fishing, crabbing, whatever, that slow cooked meal. Honey, when I left the first game the first time after um, going, coming to Savannah for the eighth grade, my aunt, was not cooking like my mom, because she left the Fusky when she was young, much younger, and she married, had children. My mom was one of 
a few of my grandparents' children. She had six. My mom, it was two of them that stayed on the Fusky. Man, they could burn. I'm talking about burn. They didn't cook, they burn. <laughs> and you could smell the food way down the road. We, I'll never forget some visitors came one time and we live back in the woods and they followed their nose to my grandmother pot and they just had to find out what was that smell so good. And you know, she just invite them on in. She said, come have some. She said, now I'm gonna give you some. I'm gonna give you plenty, and if you don't eat it, you ain't coming back. She said, now you gotta eat everything on this plate. Well, they wanted that and more. And I moved to Savannah. I moved, I'm in the corner house, and every day I'm looking to smell, because I was in a black neighborhood. I'm looking for aromas. Never smell someone cooking. So I was cooking, I up my window. I up my window. And I could hear folks say, wow, I don't know what she cooking, but it sure smell good. I've been there just tickled to death. <laughs> because food matters. And the gullah cooking, I can't say enough about it because when I left and as a young girl and my aunt was not cooking like my mom, oh, I told her. I say, you don't cook like my mama. And she say, you need to go back home to your mama. <laughs> Because, and, and being a kid, sometimes kids don't realize, you know, some of the things they say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, how people receive it. But I just had to tell her because I just could not eat that food and not think about how different my mom would have made it. You know, when she got in that kitchen and danced around that kitchen, and I say dance around that kitchen, um, we didn't have the um, endo plumbing so we had to bring in the pump water. And she danced around that kitchen, and she'd go, she had the pots and pan hanging against the wall. <laughs> oh man, and the, the smoke coming out the uh, fireplace, we had to keep the wood um, behind the stove so she don't run out. And all the chicken in the yard running around, the hogs over here, the cow out there. I mean, we were rich no matter what, because we had the food to keep us going. And mentally, you feed your soul, you feed your brain. And that would have them wake up every morning, always saying, Lord, thank you for touching me this morning and waking me up. And I used to say, why do they keep saying that? Well, I say it more than anybody now, because I am thankful and understand what they have been saying was to be thankful for having the ability to get out there and work as hard as they did and then come in. And let me tell you, that food made you forgot all that hard work you did. You sit down, you eating, mm, boy, this thing good. You forgot all that hard work you did. And every day was a recycle of it, doing what you had to do, making sure we had the best of what we Eight, and I refuse to let those memories, those food, the way they appreciate themselves um, in the sense of not giving up, not doing it someone else's way, but the way they was taught, passed down. And that's what I love about the Gullah Geechee culture is passed down. And I keep saying, please pass down your, your stories, pass down the way you cook, because these kids ain't gonna get it again. They will not be able to appreciate it unless you make sure they understand. Um, I love to, I eat out every night then. Most folks ask me, well, what restaurant you go to when you go? I say, honey, I can cook. <laughs> you know, it's not that I don't appreciate someone else's food, but I really love my food. <laughs> and that's a good thing, because you find people who cook and don't like their food. I mean, I've heard it. They say, oh, I don't like the way I cook. I'd rather some, oh, no, honey, give me my food. Because I done put the right twist on it. And I don't hold my head right. <laughs> and I'm ready. When I sit down, I know what I'm going to eat. I know exactly how that food was prepared. That is such a great thing to know, that when you have that knack of getting in that kitchen and turning, 
something into something great. It's good. And I, when I get up, I'm happy. I, I feel good. I can, I can work now. I can go back outside and work. I can do whatever I need to do. But the bottom line is food and the Gullah culture has always been important because they ate when they couldn't do a whole lot of other things. They made sure that they ate. Um, children, feed that ch child crying. Feed that child, that child hungry. It's still shut up, we gotta eat. <laughs> it was all about food. Feed them churn so they know. And I used to sing for my supper. I couldn't wait till mom cook him a pop go in the river or he's out doing something and we had to wait till he get home to eat. Oh, I got on the porch and sang, oh, Lordy, Lordy. <laughs> oh, Lordy, Lordy. My mom said, my child hungry, I gotta feed him. <laughs> so, my, and that's what made me um, continue to share and write and document and learn so much more about the things that I didn't grow up with, but know the connection of what it was that's important for me to sh uh, make sure that what little I'm doing will be a lot for someone else. And I just want folks to know that um, that blackberry dumpling you talk about, you can't beat it. You can't beat it. Reverend Sampar, I have a little something to say about that. <laughs> Sweet. Yes. It is super good. I have a question because it was a follow up question about Absolutely. you said food, why is so good? Mm. Chef Robinson. Mm. Yes. My question, follow up question is uh, rice, turkey furlough or chicken furlough. Now, to me, when I think about Bella cooking, I think of, like I said, Hot and John. I think of like a curl as such a like a quintessential gala dish. One big a dish. Yeah. A complete dish, yeah. Because the way we were, the way that it was made, I'm saying you made it because I didn't make it for <laughs> now. And I make it after like the big Christmas dinner, after the church, after Thanksgiving, because you take what seems like scraps. We called it chicken and rice. <laughs> yeah. So, but that's the fancy name. <laughs> I thought I was doing chicken and rice. Yeah. 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 chicken mm -hmm. and you add just you know you can add celery bell pepper the flavor it some peppers and then you took um, some people take the bone out but some people keep the bone in for flavor <laughs> yes seriously um, and you add the rice and then you cook it together you have to measure right now I learned long ago because you know a lot of people have problem cooking rice a lot of people have problem cooking rice. And rice, I learned that these fingers on your hand, you see these little marks on it? If you put that much water in your rice, it'll come out perfect, that much. And you can even measure it. I used to do this, that rice come out perfect. Perfect rice. Now these folks had a way of eyeballing their meal, their rice, um, water for the rice. But that amount of water. Now, and, yeah, and <laughs> that amount of water over the rice? Yes, over, over the rice. Okay. Oh, yes. Okay. Uh -huh. yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Uh, it will come out perfect. I'm it just. Now, I'm not, and I'm still trying to perfect, perfect this thing. Rice cooking is, is something else. It can be a little difficult if you don't get it, because rice, it depends. And also, it depends on the type of rice. You got all these varieties of rice now. It's not the Cal just the Carolina gold anymore. You got the long grain, the short grain, and, 
and whatever yeah. grain, all these different um, type of rice, um, short grain as, as well as long grain. I have always grew up eating long grain rice. Um, I've eaten some Carolina gold, um, but it depends on what I'm cooking because also like short grain rice, I think I had a rice called um, water, water something. Water made. I think it's a, yeah, you can't add a whole lot of water to that. I don't know why, because I'm not, I'm, you're the rice biologist, so I no, guess you have to figure that for me. <laughs> I look for me, <laughs> honestly. Well, yeah, I do not have but to yes. <laughs> yes. Um, and another thing about cooking rice, if you didn't add enough, you stir it, because steam cook rice, mm -hmm. not just that water. Water is just to add it to make it softer, but you can steam rice and it'll be great too. Steam is what cook rice, so I would take rice. I'm just sitting over here, Mom. <laughs> I would take rice and I will put, and today I put a, like a wet towel. Like if you get a little um, dry, take a wet towel, put it over that rice, put the lid on it, pow, just like that. <laughs> I know, I'm like, wow, I'm just hungry. I'm just thinking about that. I'm a Because you cook on too high a heat. Yes. That's the only thing about another yes. thing. About don't cook on high heat. These folks never cook. They cook on. They did not cook on high heat. They'll tell you, turn that pot down. Yes. You know, and don't go in that kitchen rushing and being mad at the food because you want to eat in a hurry. Just don't do that. First of all, food know when you're mad. <laughs> That's why it screws up. <laughs> That's why you can't get it right because food know you trying to rush it and it don't want to be rushed. You add the love to it. The love you put in the food, you can really taste it when you eat it. Yes. And I will say this um, very quickly to kind of tie this, this off. Um, going to the Fusky, every single lady on that island, and I won't even say lady, every single person, descendant of a Gullah on that island, it's a battle for who cooks the best. Yes. <laughs> you can buy a devil crab from anybody and you, you, you're going to be doing a, ta a, a tasting tour. It's a competition yes, it and it's, it's fighting words. <laughs> if you say somebody that's better than the other, oh, yeah. you better just take it and enjoy. Keep going. And <laughs> keep it moving and say, Woo, that, in, in the privacy of your own space, <laughs> say what was the best. But you don't say that openly. But what I will also say is, as remote as the Fusky is, you will never go hungry. True. Yeah. That's true. There is no grocery store on the island. That's true too. There <laughs> is a small little, um, if, if you want to call it a market, but by the time the sun goes down, you can forget it. You're not yeah. going down there in the golf cart. But I will say this, there's never been a time that I've been on that island that I have not felt that somebody's going to help me Somebody's going to take care of me. Somebody that looks like me. Yes. And I'm is going, going to help me, going to take care of me, yeah. um, and make sure that I have what I need. You you will never go hungry yeah. on the Fusky. And and I've told Kelly, I say, honey, let me know anything I can do. Because I have a six feet freezer. I don't run to the store every day because I can't get on that boat and run back and forth. It's too tiring. I mean, I'm at a point where I got to spare my, my, my time, to use my time a little more wisely than running over for something. So I will get stuff preserved, stuff I can preserve. That's why I still preserve. But I'll also get stuff that lasts longing that I can use. I bring stuff home. I buy bulk and I break it down and I cook it different ways. Because I don't get bored with my food. That's another thing. Um, one thing I've been taught by my parents and, and grandparents, y'all, they did not cook the same thing over and over and over. It was too much choices, too many ways to cook it. So all these books have different recipes. People say, how can you do all these books without, with, with, ain't that many um, recipes that you can make? I'm like, cause you, ain't, you don't know how to cook. Yeah. You can take chicken and turn it into many different ways. Pork, beef, all of this stuff, many different ways. And that was the talent they had, yeah. the skill 
of knowing that you can take a little and turn it into a lot. And they stretch food for, for, for mouths to feed. I have a question. Yes. So um, somebody was always hunting. Yes. Deer. Squirrel. Squirrel, rabbit. Coon. Coon. Not now. No. Oh, That's been way back. Oh, yes. Come okay. people raise their own hogs. Yeah. Well, let me yeah, tell you, yeah, those raised. hogs did not have a chance running wild on that island, <laughs> knowing people yeah. wanted to eat. Because Papa always say, he say, you know, people are so choosy about what they want to be. He even say, I can't deal with people who separate their food. You know, you eat the peas first, the rice first. Me. He said they all going the same way and come out the same place. <laughs> so what they separate them for? <laughs> it's gonna combine together. But raccoon, I did the show with Andrew Zimmerman, um, did barbecue raccoon. Mm -hmm. And to me, because I've not had Rick ha whatever goat, the Haitian. Yeah. the Haitian goat tastes like beef. It's a dark oh, red wow. meat. Yeah. And to know raccoon, you have to muss it before yeah. you cook it. Because then you got another whole t their level of taste. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, so. Same thing with possum, right? they got the, they got the, the glands, they are glands. And they grow in little hidden spots in the yeah. animal. Yeah. Yes, so you have to degland it now in I order like to. Possum, I don't care for yeah. possum either, it's yeah. too greasy. Yeah. It's like yeah. duck substitute to duck to me. Yeah. Yes, it's but really greasy. I, I mean, amen every minute. <laughs> alligator. I know, I was just like. <laughs> We used to do sea eggs. Yes, we did. And I will say that tr the traditions of, of of food and 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 sharing and do cooking plenty continues throughout all of our yes. stories and our our history. We don't know how to cook small amounts. No, we don't. Um, <laughs> my, my 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 husband's grandmother is here. She is already talking about what she's going to cook <laughs> for her grandchildren. And she has named ten, her great grandchildren. She's named 10 different things. And I'm like, yeah, grandma, absolutely <laughs> cook it all. But but it's it, it, it is that tradition. It is that sharing. And what mm -hmm. I've learned is it's that culture that gets um, passed down through the act of cooking. Mm -hmm. I've watched her with my daughters, um, teaching them how to make chicken and dumplings, mm -hmm. how to make um, dressing, how to make those yeah. things. And that's time that they're bonding together, talking about so much more yeah. than just the food. Yeah. And teaching so many more lessons than just the food. Because I hear her, well, don't you let them little boys talk to you. <laughs> and so it, it becomes way more than just we're cooking a meal. Right. It's a conversation this is, of this many is things. something, and and it will bring back for them, in those times Memories. of remembrance of oh my grandma told me this when they smell chicken and dumplings when they smell dressing mm -hmm. oh my grandma told me this yes. so those those things that food and that yes. culture continues to go Dr. And Evans yes well yeah I will just I will just say amen to all of this that I've I've. <laughs> observed with great reverence uh, my husband cooking because he learned to cook from his grandmother See, that's and um, they're from Iowa by way of Pine Bluff and so there is Arkansas yeah yeah so it's it's all of the you know the bird clan and uh, but they they he cannot cook anything for just, it's two people in the house right now. It's just me and you. And you can't Why the pot? 
Yeah. There's, you know, and fortunately we have a neighbor who is from here and she cooks. And so there's a lot of exchange mm -hmm. and there's a lot of, but you do not just cook for one, you know, you can't, you, can't, you, you literally can't do it. But it is that where you, where you learn from mm -hmm. um, and the lessons that you learn and the people that you impact in that, in that shared community building is just, it's a big yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just want to share talking about um, cooking more if enough, because my grandmother, mom, when they cooked, they always had the thought that some poor soul was going to drop by, <laughs> okay? And they was going to be hungry. And they weren't the type of people that say, we ain't got nothing to eat. If you was invited to the table. And that's why their heart was in a big place to share as well as care about others. Some poor soul, my wife, cause I was like, man, somebody gonna stop by. And how they know, honey, somebody would drop by, sure is the day. And Bertha, what you, what that pot you smell? I smell and they got, oh, you want some? It wasn't, you know, you want some? Come on in and get some. They was always getting, hog killing, let me share this, hog killing time on Defusky. Several, quite a few people killed, I mean, raised hog. And there were people who didn't. But hog killing time, and we raised hog, but we used to ride them. My parents still today don't know, and God bless their soul. Um, we used to ride the hogs when they go. That was just fun for us. When that hog was killed, my pop and a couple of men would come in and help us system because it took a lot, because these hogs were big, yeah. to dunk them, to get the hair off, to hang them in the tree. And then half of that hog went to the community, pieces. Next week, somebody else killed a hog. Half of that hog went to the community. By the time all the hog killing was done, you got back what you gave out. So you never miss what you never had. That's exactly where that was. Yes, yes. And those were the things that stuck with me and actually made, um, showed me not only to just cook it, but also share it. And today, and I, and I cook for groups, and I have food left over. I got some folks here tell you, Sally, please, come get me or call me, I'll pick it up, or I take food to them. All because I won't throw away food either, because we were not allowed to throw away food. They were no waste, you don't waste this food. I don't care what it is. And we used to eat, and I call it the rooter to the tuta. And that means from the head to the tail, to the foot. The huff, the hog huff was used for medicine. It was used for medicine. They did not waste anything. And, and that's how I saw the importance of food and why teaching my kids and, what, and, trying, and teaching some of my grandkids the benefit of doing it so that you can understand, you know what, what goes around, come around. You give today, Papa always say, one hand washes the other. He said, you know, it might be your day today, but it can be mine tomorrow. So helping someone was a big deal of why Gullah culture of people were connected in so many ways across the U.S. and from Africa because they knew how to give. So they, one day they received. They, weren't, they were mindful of helping others. And that's why I love this culture. And I love to say that I grew up with folks who cared enough to teach me enough, just enough, to where I've picked up the torch and I'm running with it. And that's why, in my heart of heart, those houses, when I see them falling down, all because they're not here, and the generation, younger generation ain't got time, you know, I'm like, this ain't right. I gotta find a way to help do something. That's why, when I go to this graveyard and see it overgrown, I can't deal with seeing them, with bushes and stuff, why? They were our lifeline. How come we letting go of it and acting like they ain't never exist? I'm sorry. That and then that the way brings us to um, yes. talking about um, what are ways that we can help with preserving that culture and ensuring that um, we don't let it fall by the wayside mm -hmm. um, okay. and, and to document that history. As we go. And I have a couple of pictures to show of what yes. we're doing. Okay. Okay. Um, what 
what we can do is not give up and not let other people tell you, oh, that ain't, that's too old or that ain't, that's not worth saving. It's worth saving because it was a part of, and for me, my childhood. And not, and letting it go would be letting it go a part of me. So the importance of restoring these homes is not gonna be great for me, but I know my ancestors are gonna be smiling in heaven, knowing that, you know what I taught that one right. And this is my grandmother house that I was born in, my mom, my great grandmom, all of, the, I mean, six generation to my knowledge were born in this house. And this house, if walls could talk, you guys, because I go, I, um, yes, the bathroom, it wasn't a bathroom on this house. They put on a bathroom in the 80s. And see, the material they use has fallen down on that house. People have been robbing the material off of it. Someone took five windows out of this house, and when, that was before I got there. When I got there, I was on the council. I joined the council, and I let them know, if I catch you around there, Gator gonna eat you. We ain't calling no law. Okay, because there ain't gonna be no evidence. <laughs> and I say that because people don't realize the importance of the history that you are stripping away that you're not going to do rightful by it. So restoring this house, these, this front porch, man, we used to sleep on the porch at night. We, had, we didn't always sleep inside a good summer night. You on the porch watching the lightning bugs, conversating. Families would come from Savannah, and we had a great time. And today, a lot of my families, we were talking about, it sure would be nice. And I know everybody can't come, don't, can't put enough together to help do it. But we do have some family members who are also carpenters, painters. I want to get involved as well to say, this is your legacy. Let's keep it going. So the importance of restoring these houses is because the minute someone else get their hand on it, they're going to do the same thing and make the money off of it. So why can't we? Okay, I'm going to answer the last question first. Doors of Dust was not done on Defusky. Yeah, but I'm wondering. Um, it, it, it was in St. Helena. Um, but um, speaking of Pat Conroy, when he wrote this book, there was a whole lot going on, you guys. First of all, this man was trying to help us be educated. What happened, he wrote this book to tell the tale how the superintendent and some of them folks which being in charge and getting all the jobs, they were doing things. And he, um, I guess it got attention because when he was teaching us about the outside world, which our parents wanted us to learn and they couldn't do it. When we, went, we might have gotten off that island maybe once a year and that would have been for Christmas shopping. So he saw that we needed to be exposed or get off that island more. So he moonlighted jobs to take us. Now, the story hit a lot of schools, and people were wondering about how he, and this book is real. This is not a fake book. I'm telling you that because I'm in it, I'm Ethel, and I know all these things happen. Now, sometimes we don't want to admit to some things that was going on that was our fault, 
like today, selling land. So when mm. the people heard about it and came, people were selling lands, giving up their legacy. Mm -hmm. He did not make them sell the land. What he did was to share what was going on wrong there because the superintendent in the school, give you an example, we were drinking powder milk. And Pat went to the superintendent and said, why are these kids drinking powder milk instead of fresh milk like the rest of the kids in Beaufort County? Because we are Beaufort County. And they told him, say, we can't get it to them. He said, you mean to tell me you can get the food to them and not the milk? Every two weeks he brought us fresh milk. That was just one of several things that he did. They did not like the fact that he was trying to correct them into giving us better education, books, material, all this stuff. And they just wasn't going to have him tell them what to do whilst he's teaching all black kids. That's what this was about, him teaching all black kids and being neglected. And we did not know a lot of things he was teaching. He opened a lot of doors for me in learning those stuff. Now, I know a lot of people figured because he wrote the book and then people started coming. You ain't gonna stop people from coming whether this book was written or not because it was already in the plan for Hay Point to be developed before Pat came. And that's why he did not want to come back to that island after they came. He said, no, I don't want to see the development. Y'all should have left that island alone. How great, our telephone company, local telephone company did not want to put telephone on that island while she was dominantly black. He went to court of another person from Savannah who was into telephone, brought the telephone, ran wires. We had a serious party line. Hargrave got mad, mm -hmm. took this gentleman to court because he was from Savannah putting phone in on the Fusky. And the only reason he won the battle, um, because Hargrave, let me back up, Hargrave wanted to wait till the development came. So the plan for them to come, been in progress. That's what most people don't know. This just kind of opened the door for people to want to see how poor we was or what was going on. And then instead of us hanging in, and I'm being honest, some of us, instead of us hanging together, we let go and stop giving the land up. Then the more land that was being given up, the less people stayed. But my family have 12 acres on one end of the island and two acres on the other. And I'm trying so hard to get them to see the necessary of keeping it. Um, but with this, they already had the plan before he came in 69. And we know that because of Hague Point, um, the people on international paper, the same company that polluted the water for the oyster for the cannery, oyster um, yeah. and ma majority of the blacks left that island, the same company came back and developed Hague Point. Instead of helping the people who families they hurt and had to leave. So it's like, how did this happen? Oh, these folks don't think about 10 years from now. They do it 20 years from now. Their plan been in motion for that island. It's the people who were living there didn't know about it. That's what the push was mm -hmm. from the Fusky. I was there, yes. The Kamias against the Benyas. <laughs> <laughs> there is about, and I can't say specifically, but right now the count is 450, and that includes the private gated community. Half of the count is in there. Um, 21 Gullah people live in there. And, but there's, the Gullah people do have a lot of property there. Mm -hmm. They really do, like these houses, and they have acres of property, but they're not doing anything with it, mainly because most of them don't know what to do or how to do it, how to utilize it. They're paying tax and complaining and getting mad. So I'm trying to give an example of helping to say, guess what, your property's valuable, we can do this. The same way they come with um, money in their pocket and build houses and rent it out, guess what, we already got ours. We just need to fix it up and do what they're doing. Yes, they are. And, uh, the gentrification is taking place throughout the area as well. And, uh, 
And can I say something? The thing about what's going on with some of the Gullah people, because even my mom, God bless her soul, when I was writing this book, I was telling her I was writing this book, and my mom said, Ann, she said, be careful how you write that book, because them people are going to get mad at you. And I said, Mom, this ain't about them, and they can't tell me what to do. Okay? I said, that's our story. And, and, and that's what I had to let her know, because she, too, was in that old setting, our old ways of thinking that writing about our history or speaking out was, a, was not good. I would be punished or, or something would happen. And I said, let them, let them, let them come, let, let them come. <laughs> but yes, their plans, these plans have been in progress for years before they even hit that ground. They did not just come and start developing out even before this book here, that plan was already there. Yes. I just don't understand, because I've had people on my tour, and honestly, this one got me more than anything. This um, lady was on the bus, and she said, you know, she said, my granddad is Gullah, but I'm not. I said, excuse me? <laughs> uh, I said, ma'am, I said, you cut from the claws. If it wasn't for him, you wouldn't be here. And she said, oh, I never thought about it like that. It's the ignorance that wasn't, that, that, that they have endured that they won't take the time to learn themselves about who they are, where they people, who they people are. If you don't take the time to learn or ask questions, then you don't know or you won't know. And I always tell my grandchildren to ask questions. If you don't know, ask questions. Don't act like you know when you don't. Ask questions. That's what's gonna help you understand things. If I don't know, I'll try to help you find out. But ask questions, and our children don't ask questions because we not storytellers like our ancestors were. They were storytellers. We didn't have to ask them to tell us a story. Hey, come here, sit down, yeah. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> so come here, sit down, yeah. Let me tell you something. And my mom had it good. She'd be like, now, when she sent me off to school, she said, now, Ann, she said, you're going over to Alma, which was her sister, to go to school. She say, don't make me have to walk that water to come get you. Uh, walk the water. And <laughs> you know what? I truly thought my mom could walk That's water. That's scary. <laughs> because I had to ob uh, abide by what she say. And I bet not act like I don't know. We don't even teach our kids manners and respect anymore. They don't have it. A lot of them don't have it because they're allowed to do whatever they want. And being allowed to do whatever you want, you're missing out on what you need to learn and need to know. And that's one of the biggest problems we have now. But I pray and hope that the more we put it out there, they do 
try to, you know, those who come to, oh my God, what I gotta say, senses, <laughs> their senses, and not believe that they not part of the Gullah culture, need to understand that you all, and more so than you'll ever um, understand, just because you weren't raised that way don't mean you're not. And that's what I think a lot of the, 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 um, the misconception of who is and who isn't. I'm like, and hey, we all beautiful colors. We got all, all kind of colors. And we're not one color. We are a multitude of color. And that's why we have to embrace our children and let them know, because they, you know, people say, they are our future. Well, what are we teaching them? I went to school, the kids didn't even know how vegetable are grown. Their favorite thing, I said, what's your favorite vegetable? Okra, okra, okra. I showed them a jar of pickle okra and not one could tell me what an okra looked like. <laughs> they, I'm like, where do you think this come from, the stove? I said, no, honey, it came from a farm. Somebody worked hard for this to get into a store. Oh, we didn't know that. But these are the things we're not taught it. We don't, we, and because we're not raised with it, it's worse because we take the food. Oh, they knew the, oh, I'm sorry, back to the okra. They only knew it breaded and cooked. <laughs> Never knew what an actual okra looked like. So I'm like, how can we teach our children about their culture if we don't involve the food that we feed them? They sit down every day to a table and eat, and you know what? Phone, we have phone. They end the phone instead of learning about what they're eating or why it's important for them to eat what they're eating. These are the little things that makes me, you know, get to the point of maybe writing and caring will help. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, okay. <laughs> And I think that's something that um, we definitely um, are trying to do as a family. Yes. As to, to say, we want y'all to go on, on vacation. We want you to enjoy the beach. But one of our mottos at Inkwell is live well, learn well, Inkwell. Yes. So come, come enjoy the beach, stay for the culture understand why you're here enjoy it all take in all the beauty but we've got to back it up with that that education piece and i think that's something that we all have to do when we do decide to make those choices and where we invest our dollars even with vacations of saying i'm still going on a vacation i'm still going to eat good i'm going to live it up i'm put on this this outfit this bathing suit but I'm also going to invest in the culture. The culture. Yes. And, and that, was, that was part of the, the 
thinking of, I understand that academics are very limited, and so it really was about creating a community conversation of academics who have the resources from the institutions to do things like teach a, you know, which was already going on, but how do we connect what's going on in Georgia with what's going on in South Carolina, with what's going on in North Carolina? And the thing is that institutions have, it's not about the academics and what we know in these conversations. For me, it's about the resources that the institutions have. And how can we leverage the institutional resources, whether that be individual people or uh, research, uh, uh, you know, like uh, resources like um, Chad Keller for in the, the public history department and all of the professors who can take their classes. And so it's really about creating a community conversation to leverage the institutional resources in that conversation rather than just the institutional uh, institutions, academics, and, re and uh, these institutions leeching the resources from the community. It's about creating that because with this with this visit, which was communally you know organized by a whole group of people who were you know really mindful and listening, there was also exposure to children and you know and and so for me it was just making sure that we have we're using the institutional resources to leverage that yes. and just even this conversation even though the audience wasn't packed there's now a connection between Auburn Avenue Research Li Library which is a community organization which is and so it's really just creating this this ever widening network to leverage institutional resources to support communities Thank you. 